finally, I'm officially free. You know? I am sorry to these defendants personally and on behalf of the criminal justice system. These individuals were convicted of crimes they didn't commit. Some even ended up facing the death penalty for these false claims. Imagine the fear they must have felt. Let's check out some innocent people that were sentenced to life in prison. Number four, Dennis Williams and Verniel Jimerson. Verniel Jimerson and Dennis Williams were sentenced to death in the infamous Fort Heights 4 case in Illinois for a pair of 1978s they didn't commit. A young woman and her fiance had been abducted, the young woman physically attacked, and both slain in an abandoned house. Williams and his friend and co-defendants, Kenneth Adams and Willie Range, were residents of the neighborhood where the couple was found and were seen on the street the night of the crime. Along with Verniel Jimerson, Williams, Adams, and Range were dubbed the Fort Heights Four. Williams, Adams, and Range were tried together in 1978 and represented by an attorney named Archie Weston. During the trial, the state presented eyewitness testimony placing Williams, Adams, and Range near the scene of the crime at the time of the crime. There was a major timing inconsistency in this witness's account, but Weston failed to point it out to the jury. A state expert testified improperly that a hair found in Williams' car microscopically matched Williams' hair. Microscopic hair comparison can never prove a conclusive match, but Weston failed to challenge this evidence. There was also incorrect serology testimony in the case. The three men were convicted, Adams received a 75-year sentence, Range a life sentence, and Williams was sent to death row. A group of journalism students took up the Fort Heights 4 case in 1996. They found a witness who had tipped police to the identity of the real criminals shortly after the crime. The police never investigated the tip. The investigating team also found two of the three men that were responsible for the crime who eventually confessed. The third was deceased. DNA testing corroborated the confessions. Williams, cleared through DNA and the investigation of persistent Northwestern students, was released in 1996, having spent a total of over 17 years in prison and on death row. Number 3. Ron Williamson Ron Williamson grew up in Ada, Oklahoma, and was the youngest of three children and his parents' only son. A talented baseball player, he was the 41st pick in baseball's 1971 amateur draft. A shoulder injury ruined his career, though, and Williamson returned home in the late 1970s. In 1988, Williamson, along with Dennis Fritz, was convicted for the death of Deborah Sue Carter. Her body had been found six years earlier. Williamson was sent to death row and spent 11 years in prison before being exonerated. In 1982, 21-year-old Carter was found dead in her apartment in Pontotoc County, Oklahoma. Fritz and Williamson were known to frequent the restaurant where the victim worked, and allegedly the victim had complained to a friend that they made her nervous. Williamson and Fritz were not charged until five years after the incident. An inmate that Fritz was paired with eventually came forward and stated that Fritz had confessed to the crime. This confession came one day before the prosecution would have been forced to drop the charges against Fritz. Another informant testified that she had heard Williamson threaten to harm the informant's mother as he had the victim. Additionally, police said that Williamson told them he had a dream about committing the crime. He allegedly told police that he dreamed that he attacked the victim. This statement was treated as a confession. Forensic testing was performed on various items of evidence. Seventeen hairs were recovered and were matched to both Fritz and Williamson, though we now know that this type of hair analysis is not a validated forensic science practice. Williamson was sent to death row, and Fritz was sentenced to life in prison. After their convictions, Fritz and Williamson filed separate appeals. Upon the denial of his claim, Fritz contacted the Innocence Project and learned that Williamson's lawyers were planning to test the physical evidence. Eventually, things worked out in their favor. Williamson and Fritz were released and exonerated in April 1999 after spending 11 years in prison for a crime they did not commit. Williamson had, at one point, come within five days of execution. Number 2. Kirk Bloodsworth Kirk Bloodsworth, a former Marine who had become a waterman on the eastern shore of Maryland, was the first person to be sentenced to death and then subsequently exonerated. He was 22 years old at the time of his wrongful conviction and served nine years in prison before he was released. In 1984, a nine-year-old girl was found dead in a wooded area, having been physically attacked and beaten with a rock. Bloodsworth was arrested based on an anonymous call telling police that he was seen with the victim that day and an identification made by a witness from a police sketch shown on television. The description of the perpetrator was a 6 feet 5 inches tall white man with curly blonde hair, a bushy mustache, skinny and tan. Bloodsworth was 6 feet, had red hair, and was well over 200 pounds. At trial, five witnesses testified that they had seen Bloodsworth with the victim. 
However, two of these witnesses had not been able to identify Bloodsworth during a lineup, but had seen him after the crime was committed on television. Testimony that Bloodsworth had said that he had done something terrible that day that would affect his relationship with his wife was presented at trial. Additionally, Bloodsworth mentioned a bloody rock during conversations with police. Though there was no physical evidence connecting him to the crime, Bloodsworth was convicted and sentenced to death row. The evidence about the rock and the conversation about his wife were challenged in Bloodsworth's appeals, stating that the bloody rock was mentioned because the police showed him a rock during the interrogation, and the incident regarding his wife amounted to his failure to buy the food she had requested. Moreover, the police failed to inform the defense that there may have been another suspect. Bloodsworth's conviction was overturned by the appellate court two years after his original conviction and he was retried. This time, he was sentenced to two life terms instead of death row. In the early 1990s, Bloodsworth learned about DNA testing and the opportunities it could provide to prove his innocence. The prosecution finally agreed to DNA testing for Bloodsworth's case in 1992. The victim's shorts and underwear, a stick found at the scene, and an autopsy slide were compared against DNA from the victim and Bloodsworth. The DNA lab determined that testing on the clothing excluded Bloodsworth and replicate testing performed by the FBI yielded the same results. Bloodsworth was released from prison and pardoned in 1993. He had spent almost nine years in prison, two of those years facing execution. Number 1. Rolando Cruz In 1983, 10-year-old Janine Nicarico disappeared from her home in Naperville, Illinois. Suffering from the flu, Janine was at home alone when she was abducted. Her body was found two days later. She had been physically attacked and beaten to death. The only clue left behind was a boot print on the front door of the home. A $10,000 reward attracted the attention of Rolando Cruz, a 20-year-old gang member who gave the police a fabricated story in the hope of collecting the reward. In the process, Alejandro Hernandez and Stephen Buckley were also implicated. In 1984, on the basis of his statements and other statements by several witnesses, Cruz, Hernandez, and Buckley, whose boot print was said to have been found on the door of the Nicarico house, were arrested. All three were charged with the death of Janine Nicarico, residential burglary, home invasion, aggravated kidnapping, and aggravated indecent liberties, among other charges. Before the trial, the lead detective in the case, John Sam, resigned in protest because he believed the three men were innocent. Prosecutors pressed ahead, basing their case on a false police claim that Cruz had revealed details of the crime that only a participant would have known on the testimony of five informants who claimed that Cruz and Hernandez had confessed on an inculpatory statement Hernandez had made while angling for a reward on two erroneous eyewitness identifications of Buckley as the driver of a car that might have been used in the crime, and on invalid forensic testimony purporting to link Buckley to the boot print left by the criminal. In addition, the original investigation was misled by erroneous dog-scent evidence suggesting a multi-perpetrator crime. The jury found Cruz and Hernandez guilty, but could not reach a verdict on Buckley. Cruz and Hernandez were sentenced to death, and Buckley was held without bond for retrial. Shortly after the trial, a serial killer named Brian Dugan confessed that he alone had committed the crime. Prosecutors dismissed the charges against Buckley, but steadfastly defended the convictions of Cruz and Hernandez. In 1995, after Cruz's second conviction was reversed and lawyers were preparing for a third trial, a police lieutenant testified at a pre-trial hearing that he took a call from two detectives who reported Cruz had made omissions. By the time the third trial started, the lieutenant had discovered that he was on vacation in Florida on the day in question and could not have taken the phone call from the detectives. The lieutenant's testimony created a damaging link in the claim that Cruz had made admissions and was a critical factor in the trial court evidence in 1995. Cruz was released immediately. Cruz was issued a full pardon based on innocence. He served more than 10 years for a crime he didn't commit. That's all for this video, folks. See you another time.